Good evening, church. It's good to see you on another Wednesday evening. Or I'm glad you're tuned in, as the case may be. Uh, tonight, uh, I wanted us to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture. Those that take surveys say that the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer are the two most known passages in the Bible among American Christianity. But this one comes in in the top five, and it's out of Luke 15. And I, it's, the, it's the story of the prodigal son. And other than maybe the 23rd Psalm, this is one of the favorites of American Christians. Because many of us, are, we identify with the prodigal. But I've entitled this, The Father Had Two Sons, because I want us to go to what it really says. Now, verses 1 and 2 of Luke 15 gives us the introduction, uh, the context of what this is about. And in chapter, Luke 15, cha chapter 15, verse 1, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And then in verse 3, So he spoke to them this parable, saying, And then he goes on about the sheep and the lost sheep, the lost coins, and then, beginning in verse 11, we pick up where I want us to pick up. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. I think the King James might say riotous living. Uh, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. The word join there means he forced himself. The guy really didn't want to hire him, so he gave him a job that no self-respecting Jewish boy would do, feeding the swine. In verse 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before uh, you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the father said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe. Put it on him. Put the ring on his hand and the sandals on his feet and bring the fat calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. And then enters the second son. Now his older son was in the field. As he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry, would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me. And all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. Uh, for your brother was dead and is alive again. And was lost and is found. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of scripture. It has so much depth and meaning for us. 
Lord, would you make it come alive and teach us from your word? Remind us uh, to take this scripture and apply it to our hearts and lives and we'll grow from it. And Father, speak to those watching tonight that might not have accepted you publicly as Lord and Savior about their need to do that very thing. These things I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This parable, the father had two sons, uh, teaches us a lot of things. Um, it teaches us about sin and how God deals with those who sin. And that was one of the questions of the day for the rabbis that they would argue back and forth, but never really come down on how it was supposed to be. And so I believe Jesus uses this to show how God treats those who have been in sin and come to him in repentance. You know, it, it's, it's sort of like the uh, teacher that was teaching on Adam and Eve, and, and she said, now, what was Eve's punishment for disobeying God? And one little girl raised her hand and said, ooh, I know, I know. And she said, okay, Susie, uh, what was her punishment? She said, she had to crawl on her belly and eat dirt the rest of her life. And some mothers would say, amen. I like the way that Matthew teaching in uh, his children's ministry taught on Adam and Eve. He said, now what was Eve's punishment? And before he could call on anybody, one little girl raised her hand and said, she had to have kids. And mothers again would say, amen. But my favorite one is uh, speaking at a church camp and talking about sin and asking them now, now, we were talking really about Christian behavior and how you're supposed to act as a Christian. And, and he says, I said, now what do we have to do before we expect to be forgiven of sins? And one little boy popped up, we have to sin first. And he was right because he was looking forward to the sin. But you see, we need to understand that right relationship with God is based upon our repentance and placing our faith in Jesus Christ. God waits for us to come back to him. He waits for us. He draws us. He woos us. We would never come back on our own. We need to have that clear. God is a seeking God. And he wants people to be saved. And he waits for us. And he, he draws us with the Holy Spirit so that we will repent and place our faith in Jesus Christ. And, and that is how we have a right relationship with God. Now, a lot of people get it mixed up. They want to add things to it. They want to take things away from it. They want to ignore what scripture. But this Bible tells us this, this parable about the father having two sons. So briefly, let's just look at it. First of all, notice the people. The people. Now, there are a lot of people involved here. And, and I said, the who? The original hearers were identified in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15. It said, all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. So they're there. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And in verse 3, so he spoke this parable to them, saying, and in Luke 15, he gives us three parables. Uh, the 99 sheep that are present and the one that's lost. And the shepherd goes out and finds the one, comes back and rejoices and and Jesus says there's more rejoicing over one sinner who repents than all the righteous. And then the lady, the widow lady that, that lost uh, one coin out of ten, she sweeps her house and she finds one coin and, and they have a party because she's so happy and the same thing. And then he comes to this story. See, the original hearers are the sinners, the tax collectors, the Pharisees, the scribes, the crowd, his disciples, the you need to understand, I believe Jesus wanted the sinners and tax collectors, also grouped in sinners, the worst of the sinners in the Jewish eyes, to see themselves in this parable. But he didn't leave it there because remember he said the father had two sons. The younger son is represented by the prodigal, the one who leaves. The elder son is represented by the other group that he wanted to address. The Pharisees, the scribes, those who were righteous according to their eyes in the law. And, and God, Jesus wanted them to see themselves also. Therefore, he wants us to see ourselves today in this very parable. We need to always remember that scripture meant something to those it was written to. You cannot take it out of context 
of the word that is written, but you can't take out of context of the historical situation. But let's understand something. If you leave it in the long ago history, it becomes a little dull, a little dry. It means nothing to today. And scripture always means something for us today. We know this because the book of Hebrews in chapter 4, uh, verse 12 says, The word of God is living and active, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, without the application of Scripture to our lives, what does it mean to us today? It's just a history lesson. Why do so many folks say, oh, I don't want to go to the church? Because they get a history lesson rather than applying to their lives. Scripture is based in the understanding upon our relationship, not our religion. Do we have a relationship with the living Lord? The Spirit makes His Word come alive. We see it. James says that we're supposed to observe ourselves. It's like looking in a mirror. A man who, who doesn't keep the Word of God is like the one who looks in the mirror and forgets what he looked like as he walks away. Jesus said that those who kept his word and did his word, he likened to a wise man who built the house on the proper foundation. The rain came, the wind blew, the floods came. The house was saved. Those who didn't keep the word, the obedience to the word, were like the foolish man who didn't worry about a foundation. He just built it on sand. And the rains came. Uh, the wind blew, the flood beat against the house, and great was its ruin, its collapse. So scripture always means something to us today. And so when we say, the who was this written to, we need to answer me, us. But not just that, when you get into the parable itself, we have the characters. We have the Father. I think the Father represents God. God the Father providing, and the younger son leaving, and then the son coming back, and the way he greeted him. The point that we need to remember out of this parable is that that father is a loving father. That father loves sinners. That father waited for them to come to repentance as his love waited, and his love was long-suffering, and his love reached out, and his love drew them back, because it says, when the son came to himself, he'd been out of his right mind, living in sin, and he remembered there is a father, there is a God, there is one waiting for me, there is one who I can be loved by. And when he comes to his right mind, he repents and he says, I've sinned against heaven and against you in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I think that represents 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we're instructed to do that in Acts 3.19, where it says this, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. We say, loving, heavenly Father, God, in this parable. Then we see the younger son. He goes away physically. He's spiritually dead. You can see him coming to the father and say, Oh, daddy, I'm tired of working around here. Give me what's mine. I'm leaving. Now, he didn't have to do that, but the father does. And there the spool brat, the baby child, goes off. Lost as a goose, separated from the father's love. In a world of sin. Then the third main character. You have the father, the younger son. You have the elder son. Now physically he stays close by. Physically he thinks he's pleasing the father. Physically he goes through the motions. He does works. It's not based on faith. It's not based on relationship. It's just works. A lot of people think because they're good. Because they're better than the average quote unquote person. That, that they're okay with God. Because they do good works. They're not bad people. They don't run around stealing. They don't run around committing murder. They don't run around having affairs. They don't do this or they don't do that. Or whatever sin they, they think is the worst, they're not guilty of that. And some of them are good, pretty good moral people, but that doesn't save you. Those are works. And they're dead works without faith in Jesus Christ. 
I know that he's far away from the Father, that he'd already left based on what happens in verses 28 through 30 when he comes and he finds everybody celebrating. Instead of being happy that that the, the younger brother was back, he, he begins to pout. He gets angry. He won't come in. He says, as soon as this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours comes home, you kill the fatted calf, the one who's wasted uh, your living with prostitutes. The Bible says he did some riotous living or he did some wanton living and it might have included that but it doesn't say what and so he was already thinking what he would have done if he had been the younger brother leaving he wasn't near the father he didn't ever go where the father really wanted him and so we need to look at this parable and where do we see ourselves and where do we see others that we need to pray for so those are the people parable was addressed to and the parable in the people that were in the parable they should be us then I want you to remember the practice again this parable is about how does God receive sinners and to Jesus he said he came to seek and to save the lost he didn't make any distinction distinction and rich and poor uh, between those who who were really good and those who were really bad he didn't make any distinction, distinction between men or women, young or old. You see, his said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. In other words, his deal was to reach all that God would call. And that's what we're to be about as a church. And I see the religious leaders. They only wanted to reach the respectable. I'm sure there are churches in our land who only... Certain types are welcome in their congregations. Let us never be that way. There are those places where I have preached before where uh, only certain colors are welcome. We must not be that way. We need to understand that the religious leaders only wanted those that were respectable. If you're in that boat, shame on you. You need to repent. And then, what is the practice of Jewish families? The reason this was so shocking to the people that heard this parable first was the practice of Jewish families. The youngest son only got one third. The older son got two thirds of all the inheritance. When the father died, they received the inheritance, not before. And not only that, but the younger son always had to serve the older son because the older son became the spiritual and physical leader of the family once the father had passed off the scene. And so by coming to his father and demanding what was his, the younger son gave up all rights to be a member of the family. He gave up all privileges of being a son. As he stormed off with his inheritance, thinking now that the good times roll, he was anathema dead to his family. He had no right to expect any help from them whatsoever. The older son had stayed. He hadn't given up one thing. But he hadn't enjoyed not a single privilege of being the son and he had not enjoyed, now get this, being with the father. You can go through all the emotions of religion and feel empty inside. You can go through all the emotions of religion, all the ceremonies, all the works you want to do, and still feel dead inside because you are. It's based on works, not upon faith, repentance, and therefore a relationship. That's where we see the older brother. If all you did was join the church, you're still dead in your sins. If all you did was get baptized, but you didn't repent and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're still dead in your sins. There's no joy. There's a strict Phariseeism that if I do this checklist, I'm okay. And God knows I'm okay. Well, pastor, don't you know a preacher? Don't you know what I, I do? I give this much money to the church. I give this much time to the church. I teach Sunday school. I am a deacon. I am a, a blah, 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 whatever. My granddad started this church. Well, praise God for your grandpa. Praise God that you're doing some good things. That's not what I said. I said, 
Have you a relationship with Jesus Christ as your living Lord and Savior? If not, if not, you're dead in your sins. If I don't, I'm dead in my sins. So that was the practice of Jesus, the religious leaders, and the Jewish family. But what about the possibilities? The first possibility I see happening is a party. See, the father is looking for the son. He sees him a long way off. The son doesn't have to come and confess. The father goes, can you see him falling on his neck and kissing him? And in the Greek, it means he continued to kiss him. He was so excited. Oh, son, I'm so glad to see you. Oh, my baby boy is home. Oh, thank you, God. You're home. God is pictured there tenderly kissing the sinner that's come home. Throw in a party. Bring out the best robe. Bring out the sandals and put on his feet. The son had no right to those. The son came home just to be a hired servant. The son just wanted to be in the father's house, even as a servant. And yet he said, put the robe on him, the sandals on his feet, put the ring on his finger, a sign of sonship. He accepts, accepts him back and is a full member of the family. Party, kill the fatted calf. And they did so and they began to make merry because the son who was lost was found. He was dead, but he's alive again. It's a picture of the rebirth, of the new bird. But there's somebody missing from the party. Let me ask you a question. Whose party was it? And someone will say, well, it was the prodigal's party. No, it wasn't. It was a family party. The father said, let us make merry. Let us celebrate. The us should have included that older brother. But again, my contention is he was never where he should have been. You know, he was a farmer. He's out working in the field. Says he came in from the field and wondered what was going on. Look, wherever daddy was, he should have been. When daddy was crying over the lost boy, he should have been crying over his lost brother. Whenever dad was looking on the horizon, he should have looked up to see who was there. When dad saw him and ran to him, the older brother should have been right there. If he was really where he was supposed to be. As a matter of fact, I go so far as to say it would have pleased the father if the older son would have gone out searching for his younger brother, trying to bring him safely home. That's the picture of the shepherd seeking the lost sheep or the lady seeking the lost coin. But the older brother is just grim and dutiful and there's no joy in his service because he isn't doing it for the right reason. He's respectable and he's awful. Did I see myself there? I see folks walk in that I know have been involved in sin. In my heart, I think, what are they doing here? I'm the elder brother. If I see them and wonder, and they come down the aisle, are they genuine? And they've, they've repented, knowing their background? I'm the elder brother. If I can't celebrate when they dress different, talk different, look different, smell different, I'm the elder brother. I'm a Pharisee or a scribe. He only wants those that are upright and respectable in the church. Am I one of those sinners that the Father has welcomed home? And I've experienced the party, and so when others come, I join in with that celebration. Where do we see ourselves in this parable? So the party is one possibility. I hope we're having one. The second one is the pardon. Again, this, this, this parable graphically illustrates God's attitude towards those who messed up, towards those who sinned, to those who need to come in repentance and faith in Jesus. Because when we come like that, we have a pardon. There is forgiveness. It's a pardon. It's not a get out of jail free card. 
It's not to abuse the grace of God. It's not to feel like that we're superior. It's to say, woe is me, I'm a sinner. Forgiven by Jesus Christ. It's a pardon. Have you received your pardon? But there is a problem. I look at this scripture and I can't believe the older brother acts like this. Again, look how graphic the scripture is. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field where he thought he should be. As he came, he drew near the house. He asked, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and says, uh, Joe, come over here. What's going on? Is there some kind of party dad didn't tell me about? I mean, here it is the middle of the day and we're supposed to be working the crops and taking care of the, the sheep and the goats, the flocks. What, what, what's going on? And the servant said to him, your brother has come and because he's received him safe and sound, your father's killed a fatted calf. Oh, baby's home. Hallelujah. Let me wash myself off and let's party. I can't wait for some good ribeye. No. Verse 28 says he was angry. He was wroth. He was so angry he was beside himself. He was so angry he couldn't be consoled. His father came out and pleaded with him. And he said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Checklist. Checklist. Not relationship. And yet, you never gave me just a little young goat that I might marry with my friends. Here's the thing I want you to ask yourself. Did he ask the father for a young goat? Did he have a relationship with the father where he could make Mary? Did he really care about the brother being gone? Or did he just say good riddance? He got what he deserved. Mm. So there is a problem. See, the older son was a whiner, a murmurer, a complainer, however you want to describe him. He didn't ever enjoy the benefits of being a son. He didn't ask for the benefits of being a son. He just thought, I can do it myself. So that leads me to some conclusions. The older son was full of self-pity. Woe is me. I serve and I serve and I serve and God isn't blessing me. And yet, look what he's doing. These folks think they can come out of sin and just be equal with me. The older son was self-righteous. Well, I didn't do this and I didn't do that. God's pretty pretty good lucky to have me. I've always served. I've always been. You know, here's the way it spells out today. Well, these young people, these young people, yes, praise God for these young people. They're good people. They're learning. They're serving. Maybe in different ways than we've thought of, but that doesn't make them wrong. In a lot of ways, they might be even more faithful because they want a cause to believe in. And when you give them the cause of Jesus Christ impacting communities here and around the world, they join. And they'll get busy as we teach them and gather away and let them serve. Too often they'll volunteer and what we tell them is, oh, we got it covered. We got it covered. We don't need help. And then we wonder why they don't want to help the next time or the time after that. When it's thrown in your face that, well, we got this, you're not really a part yet. Why would they want to help? Don't be an older brother. The last thing I see is that this older brother was full of unforgiveness. Nowhere are we ever told the older son repents and restores a relationship with his father or his younger brother. Because he was so unforgiving, I don't think he ever experienced the forgiveness of the father.